Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be interviewing a friggin' legend. I just cannot tell you how astounded I am. John A. Russo, the co-writer of Night of the Living Dead, the co-producer of Night of the Living Dead, and he even plays a zombie in it. And I just cannot tell you how fucking excited I am. I mean, this guy is a legend, and he's still making movies today. I actually got to meet him back in February when I was covering Silver Scream Fest in Santa Rosa. He was a very nice man. I was on a budget that day. I couldn't get um, an autograph or a selfie with him, but I plan to in the future. But um, I get to interview him today, and I'm so excited. It's going to be so cool, so cool. Oh, yeah. So, without further ado, here is my interview with John A. Russo. Totally radical. It's it's such an honor because um, you were a huge part of one of the greatest movies of all time in the golden age of era of, of horror. And I thank you so much for taking your time today. Oh, you're welcome. So... Um, were you into uh, movies uh, when you were growing up? You know, all of us kids were. And, uh, I mean, we watched, I watched just about every movie that came into town. And in those days, we had three movie theaters. I grew up in a town called Clarence, Pennsylvania. It still has the world's largest coke works. But the mills have gone down. The town in those days had 25,000 population and... It was pretty much a booming little town in uh, 12 miles south of Pittsburgh. And the movies changed twice a week, so that was a lot of movies. When you're a kid, you went in for 14 cents. When you turned 12, it was 50 cents, which was a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, yeah, I, I, I saw a lot of movies. Were you um, a big fan of the uh, horror and sci fi genres? Not especially because most of the stuff that was being made was lousy. You know, <laughs> you'd go to the movie and there'd be a big deal made out of the movie and the preview trailers or whatever. And then there was a lot of stuff like uh, because of uh, the two bombs that, that had gone off, nuclear bombs. There were a lot of things based on radiation, attack of the giant ants, attack of the giant caterpillar, the giant cat. Uh, <laughs> Frank Mattis and all that stuff, and it was all trite, formulaic stuff. It wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. Can you remember specifically the first movie you ever saw? Yeah, it was, uh, it was the old Claude Rains uh, um, Phantom of the Opera. Oh. I was only six years old, and it was all, the movie was already old then. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, a, that's a good one. I love all the old uh, black and white RKO, RKO Universal that, movies. That was a color one. The one I saw was in color. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, okay. When did um, you realize you wanted to be a uh, writer and filmmaker? Uh, well, I knew I had writing talent from, you know, I, I was reading to, uh, Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Huckleberry Finn and a lot of stuff like that when I was only in fourth grade. And, and uh, teachers asked us to write a poem one day. It was a substitute teacher in fourth grade. And I wrote this poem, and she spent the whole rest of the day trying to find out where I copied it from, which I didn't. You know. Yeah. So, so I kind of awakened to the idea right then that I had some writing talent. So... By the time I got was graduating from high school, I wanted to write a mystery novel. But then I started it, but I didn't get very far. I didn't really have the craftsmanship then. Mm -hmm. So when did uh, you meet uh, George A. Romero? Well, we met when uh, I was 18 years old, and so was he. So it was Ross Steiner and my friend Rudy Ritchie from Claire, and we, we were friends, and... Uh, he enrolled in Carnegie Mellon as a fine arts major, and I was at West Virginia University in English education. So Rudy told me I 
on the phone or a letter, I forget, I think it was on the phone, and he said, first day on campus, I met this great guy, George Romero. He's an RO and I'm an RI, Richie and Romero. Mm-hmm. We were together in line wearing our fresh beanies. And, uh, and then in art class, we're supposed to be drawing, drawing the nude model. He's drawing scenes from Ben Hur in his, in his scratchbook. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I said, well, he, well, that's great. So he said, you have to meet George when you come home from Christmas break. So I did. We drove up to George's apartment in the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, where all most of the college campuses are. And all, really off the horn, and George came down on the street wearing a big sombrero, two, two uh, ammunition belts, and two pistolas, and a big drooping black mustache. And he got in the car. And uh, we went to a Dairy Queen to get ice cream, and the girl slammed the window shut and went late on us. So we just got a big laugh out of it. <laughs> George was dressed like that. He was, Sometimes he'd dress up like characters in his favorite movies, and one of his favorite movies right now was Zeta Zapata, which is a great movie starring Marlon Brando. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's John Steinbeck wrote, wrote the screenplay. It's a fabulous movie. Yeah, that is a very good... We became friends right from age 18, that Rust couple. I think on that same vacation, because we went to see a play he was in, and that, and Russ met George, and we all met, we both met Russ, and and that's it. We've been friends from 18 years old until George died, so Russ and I still work together on stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. So, uh, which one of you, or did all all three of you, come up uh, with the idea for Night of the Living Dead? No, that was me and George, and we were the two writers in the group, and uh, we batted ideas around me and George, and uh, I said whatever we did needed to start in the cemetery because the cemeteries people find spooky, even uh, habit for. Costello and me, Dracula, it's scary, but it's funny at the same time. They're in the cemetery with a coffin and the candlesticks are moving all over the coffin and so on. So, uh, George, uh, I was working on a thing where aliens come to Earth in search of human flesh. Right. And the way you find it out is this kid's running away from home and he steps through a pane of glass in the ground and under that pane of glass is a rotting corpse, like, 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 you know, like, people keep tomatoes under a, under a pane of glass in the winter time to grow them. They like them a little rotted. So that, mm-hmm. the idea was that they'd be killing people and keeping them under panes of glass to rot a bit, like in the medieval times if they shot a goose, they'd hang it up to rot for a few days before they ate it. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was the idea. Then George came away for a few days before Christmas that year. He came back with uh, 20 or 30 pages of what eventually became the opening of Night of the Living Dead. And he had this brother and sister going to the cemetery, and the girl being chased, and the brother hit his head, his head, head hit against a tombstone. And I read it, and I said, you know, this is pretty good, George. It has all the right suspense, twists, and turns, and so on. But you don't say, Mm -hmm. who's attacking this girl? Who are they? And he said he didn't know. I said, well, reading it, it seemed like they could be dead people. He said, that's good. I said, but what are they after? They don't bite, they don't claw, why are they chasing her? Mm Mm-hmm. Again, he said he didn't know. I said, why don't we use my flesh-eating idea? That's good. So that's how they became dead people in search of human flesh. So really, I'm the one that invented flesh-eating zombies. And uh, I took all that material, and I threw this thing that was in story form, not screenplay form, so I rewrote it in screenplay format 
and we'll go up a steep hill. Mm-hmm. And, and then I wrote the second half of the script myself. And uh, when I got it done, George and I were going out to Rudy Ritchie's place to grill steaks and drink wine. And George was going to read the script. Mm-hmm. He read it. He says, there's something wrong with it. And I said, what? I said, anything wrong with it? He said, uh, here, Rudy, you read it. So Rudy read it, and he said, there's nothing wrong with it. It's fine. And George said, uh, I know what he needs. He needs another siege. And what he meant was that there ought to be a place where the ghouls almost break in the house if they don't succeed. And then finally they do. They have to run the house. So we didn't write it, we just did it when we were filming. Mm-hmm. How, how did you uh, get funding for the movie? Boy, I've told that story a million times. It was my idea, again, to do the film. Mm-hmm. The town of us Close associates, people, five or six of us that work together in our company. And each, I said, if each person kicks in 600 bucks, we'll have 6,000. And we should be able to make something better than this crappy stuff that's on late night chiller theater and so on. So that's how we got it started. We sold a little bit of stock after that, ran up all our suppliers' accounts and bills and credit cards and whatever. Mm-hmm. And eventually, uh, you know, the final <clears throat> cost after we paid bonuses and when it made a little bit of money, it was about 114000 that we had into it. Mm-hmm. With... Uh... You, when you played um, a, a, a person who becomes a zombie in the movie, um, how long did it take for uh, your makeup to be applied? Well, I don't know, about a half an hour or so. And Carl Hardman did it with Dermal Wax, which we only have one can of Dermal Wax, and that's Mortician's Wax. If somebody's face is damaged or their nose is cut off or whatever, they use that to reconstruct the nose or the wound, you know. So we only had one can of that, and that's what was used, and it was hard to get off. It hurt. You had to use a table knife to scrape it off. Mm-hmm. So. So when um, when the movie comes out, and it's the scariest, it's called the scariest movie of all time, and it's a huge hit, and um, the movie, unfortunately, falls into the um, public domain. Were, were all of you upset about that? Oh, uh, we. We never agreed with that. We, it wasn't our fault. You know, technically, under the law, if a third party does you harm, mm-hmm. that, in that realm, it, which it was the distributor that didn't earn our copyright notice in when they changed the title, mm-hmm. changed the title from Night of Anubis to Night of the Living Dead, they put their logo in and neglected to put our either on purpose or stupidity or whatever. So we've been battling the copyright office ever since, and we've never given up. But it's absolutely a, a great injustice that they did us right. by not allowing us to do that. We actually did have a copy. They did allow us to register it, but we had a registration until 1995 when some jerk in the copyright office decided that to revoke the copyright, we're still battling it. So we haven't given up on that. Mm-hmm, that's good. Does it uh, still amaze you um, that 50 years later so many people love the movie? It's, no, it, nothing amazes me anymore. I mean, I've been with it all the way. You know, Russell and I were the directors of the company that made it for 50 years, so we've been involved with every single thing all the way through. And uh, so it, it's, it's not amazing. I, you know, I, I was dropped, dropped my daughter off at the pit campus the other day, and some young mm-hmm. girl comes up to me, can I take a picture with you, because you, you're in my favorite movie, so she recognized me, so her girlfriend took a picture, you know, another time I'm in a bar, and my own hometown, this young guy 
guy kept looking at me and I didn't think he was gay or anything. I, <laughs> you think of the 1990 remake? Uh, uh, Tom Savini, he was he was originally supposed to do makeup for the first one, but he got drafted, right? No, he was way too young. He he was never he, he was a little kid when he made Night of the Living Dead. Oh, okay. So um, no, he was it was never ever. I didn't even know. Him oh, okay, that was just that, I guess that was just a rumor or something. What um. What do you think um, is 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 George's uh, legacy? Well, obviously the um, you know his slate of, of, of zombie movies. Uh, you know, I mean, George was was a highly intelligent and gifted person, not just in movie making, but he was an excellent artist. He was a fine artist and a cartoonist and a portrait artist and great with music and you know George was a sort of a renaissance man which we he and Russ and I did kind of consider ourselves renaissance men in, in that we are were and are interested in everything going on in the world politics the arts music whatever and uh, so our, that's what our conversations were all about not just about movies so um, you know, I think George's intelligence, his, his uh, exploration of different ways to go with the zombie phenomenon. Uh, you know, he he uh, always he tried to be original and creative with everything he did. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what else can I say? Yeah, he's one of the masters of horror, definitely. After uh, Night of the Living Dead, you worked with George again on There's Always uh, Vanilla. Um, why weren't you involved in the um, in the other uh, Living Dead movies? Well, I wasn't involved with his because I left the company. Mm -hmm. so he brought he brought his wife and her boss into the company, which I agreed with because we needed people to do sales and. And, you know, in the year and a half that they were there, they didn't sell one single job. So, so Russ left, Gary left, I left, Paul McCullough left. Um, you know, it, it's it, what do you do? It's in Georgia's life, so you can't, you know, you can't fight it. <laughs> yeah. So I was offered more money to stay by George, and I, I just decided that I couldn't put up with that any longer what they were doing to the company. Left. What did you uh, think of those movies? Uh, well, Dawn of the Dead uh, turned out, you know, George and I read each other's script. Uh, he read Return of the Living Dead, the straight horror version. Mm -hmm. I read Dawn, and his version, his Dawn of the Dead originally was about two, a man and wife in a crawl space of a mall. It was, it was a very claustrophobic kind of movie. Actually, he kind of appropriated some of my ideas, you know. <laughs> the, the, uh, all, he, he saw a way to open up his movie, and uh, 
I had a raiding party in the, in in Return of Living Death that was was you know raping, looting, and cavalry shooting down ghouls and so on. That became a SWAT team in Dawn of the Dead. So, mm-hmm. but I still I said uh, you know you're, I think you're going to make a bloody fortune with this movie, George. I said the excessive blood and gore isn't exactly my cup of tea, but going to make a bloody fortune, and he smiled and whatever, because there was a special screening, and we were having dinner together, and I said that. And I didn't, you know, I didn't rain on his parade at that point. Mm-hmm. But uh, I always wanted George to succeed. He, he, we were in the trenches together, and he certainly worked hard all his life, and uh, so I always rooted for him. Day of the Dead, I absolutely hated. So, <laughs> I think it was a really big mistake because I was there on location for three days and I went to the rap party and I think George had all the ingredients to make a good movie, but he didn't, you know, yeah. the movie was just people shouting, shouting and swearing at each other. If he would have had some sympathetic characters, I thought it was going to be people like, almost like alien with these people trying to get out of this cave and, and, around any them could be a crazy army person or a ghoul. Mm-hmm. And that there would have been, but there was nobody to root for in that movie. There was just this, this staccato kind of editing that, you know, all chopped up and people's yelling at each other through the whole movie. So I really didn't like it at all. Yeah. Yeah, Day of the Dead. The ones I like, I like Bruiser. I like uh, Season of the Witch. Mm-hmm. A, a lot, I thought. Bruiser is kind of underrated. I really like Martin. I think, in a way, it's one of his best films. Yeah. And so, even though it was made on a low budget, but it, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very suspenseful film. Yeah, Day of the Dead is my least favorite of uh, the original Dead trilogy, although I do think Top Savini did some of his best makeup in it. But, um... Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't into, you know, the makeup was the makeup. And mm-hmm. the makeup people, they, they think their, movie, their effects are the movie and they're not. Yeah. He does the perfect, you know, the, the effects don't matter. So, um, uh, in, in general, although the howling, I thought those bladder effects, transformation effects, they were kind of, kind of fascinating, but... Mm-hmm. Done stupidly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not me. Yeah. You'd have somebody standing there for five minutes while this transformation happens. At least if they had the person tied up and then the creature's transforming in front of them. But they didn't do that. So, but nevertheless, the effects were great. Yeah. <laughs> it's really silly. Uh, so, uh, you and Russ uh, wrote the story for um, The Return of the Living Dead? Yeah. Russ and Rudy and I worked on the script, and I wrote most of it, most of the ideas in it again were mine. Rudy kind of botched them up. We gave him the task of writing the first draft of the screenplay, and I had to take it over and rewrite it. So, um, um, but uh, that film still should be made, and maybe it will be. Somebody bought me a script from Tom Fox's estate, and they're trying to raise money to make that film or make something like it. Mm-hmm. So what made you uh, get into writing novels? Well, I just, I, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a novelist. And when we met George, he was nuts about making movies, and we all we all were. He got he got into it as a young kid. We kind of screwed around with 8 millimeter cameras, me and Rudy, and we, we made some stuff that, you know, wasn't much to speak of, and then once we met, all got together, uh, then we got excited about making movies, but I never stopped wanting to write novels as well, so mm-hmm. new novels coming out October 1st, 9, uh, 2018, which is the exact 50th anniversary of the world premiere of Night of the Living Dead. It's from Kensington Books, a trade paperback. It's called uh, The Epidemic of the Living Dead. And it again is 
totally original and brand new stuff happening that I don't think anybody's done before. Oh, that's great. So um, you're still making movies. Do you have anything that um, you're working on? We just finished um, My Uncle John is a Zombie, and it's a really good movie. It's on Dread Central. I mean, clips are, are there on MyUncleJohnIsAZombie.com. So it's uh, getting really good reviews and great audience reception at festivals and so on. And uh, my... We just started marketing. It just went out to buyers last week. So we'll see what kind of deal we get. It deserves to have wide distribution because the audience is loving. But I play the lead role in it. I, I play the Uncle John character, and uh, I'm getting great reviews as well. So it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. Rob Lucas directed it, and he's uh, he was the producer of the Night of the Living Dead 40th anniversary documentary. He shot the and edited the Slayer video that was the top music video of 2015. Mm -hmm. And he shot and edited John Carpenter's two music videos. You know, he's on tour with his music. Mm -hmm. and Rob did a great job co-directing. I had to have a co-director because I was on camera a lot. So... Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. do you have any um, upcoming uh, convention appearances? Yeah, my next one's Chicago Flashback coming up first weekend of August. I have all kinds of, you know, then I'm going to be at the Steel City Convention, Monster Bash, a whole bunch of, you know, I, I do 15 or 20 conventions or personal appearances every year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard Flashback Weekend is a good the, one. Uh, Michael John is a Zombie is being shown at the Film Festival of Syracuse in September. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I, I met you at uh, Silver Scream Fest back in February. Oh, yeah, that was a really nice show, yeah. Yeah, I hope I meet you again because I, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to get your autograph that, that night, but um, uh, hopefully next time I will. Um I thank you so much, uh, John. This was such a great honor um, and, a, and something something really interesting, too. Uh, 162 episodes of the show. You're my first writer-director I've interviewed. Oh, okay, thanks. Yes, absolutely. Well, you have yourself a great day, and thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Have a good day yourself. Okay. Bye. Walk safe. Bye. Well, there you have it. John A. Russo. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, sir. John Russo, that was so awesome that I got to talk to you a little bit about the legacy of Night of the Living Dead. It was just so awesome. Well, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.